and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. It's so great to be together for week two of our series, Heart of Worship, Servanthood. We're so blessed to have our good friend and coach, Peter Chu, as he takes our team through what God has to say about Christianity being a team sport. Let's hit the field together. Our text for today is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. And on the slide that is on the projector, you will see two other related passages if you want to further explore this subject uh, on your own. As you turn to 1 Corinthians 12 in your Bibles, I want to share with you the purpose for the series on servanthood. First, if you are serving at peoples, this series is affirmation and appreciation for all that you do. Thank you, and please keep doing what you're doing. If you have yet to join a serving team or if you've been wondering, should I join one or not, this series is an invitation for you to engage and participate. Let me first set the context for our passage today. The book of 1 Corinthians is Paul's instruction manual on how to do church. It's his policies and procedure manual. First, he addresses problems that were specific to the Corinthian church. And then he lays out more general principles and practices for how to have healthy church life in general. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is set up like a sandwich. You have an opening paragraph and a closing paragraph that talk about spiritual gifts. Our text today is sandwiched in the middle. In those opening and closing paragraphs, Paul establishes a theme that he then carries through the rest of the chapter. What is this theme? Let's take a look at verses four, five, and six. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Notice the pairing of different and same, different and same, different and same. Different kinds of gifts, same Spirit. Different kinds of service, same Lord. Different kinds of working, same God. Also notice the repetition of the phrase same. Same spirit, same Lord, same God. That phrase is repeated nine times between verses 4 and 11. Paul's point, there are many different gifts, but one giver. His emphasis is not on the gifts, but on the one giver. Look at verse 11. It is the spirit that determines the gifts. It is the spirit that distributes the gifts. Paul's theme is unity with diversity, not unity through uniformity. It is unity with diversity. With this theme in mind, let us read the passage that we're looking at today, verses 12 to 27. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. The body of Christ is the church, and Paul uses a very creative image, the human body, to explain the nature and function of a healthy church. His first point is that there is one body, one church with many different members. He is continuing the theme of unity with diversity. The opening and closing paragraphs, one giver, different gifts. Here in our text today, one body, different members. Unity with diversity. Where does he point that out? Let's begin in verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. His big idea is there is one body with many different members, each with different gifts, unity with the diversity. Well, who is building this body? Who's putting all the members together? Who's in charge? Now, there are many reasons why we would ask those questions. We could be curious, we could be seeking to comprehend, or we're just not happy and we want to find out who do we complain to. Okay? I don't want to be part of the body, I just want to do Christianity on my own. I don't like where I've been placed. I don't like my job. Who do I talk to? Paul's second point is, it is God that has placed us. The opening and closing paragraphs point out that it is the same Spirit, same God, same Lord that determines and distributes gifts. It is the same God that determines and distributes where the members of the body go. Verse 13, we were all baptized by one Spirit to form one body. Verse 18, God has placed the parts in the body every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Verse 24, but God has put the body together. Well, if God's assembling this body and building it, how does he go about doing it? Let's look at verse 18 in more detail. God has put, God has placed the parts in the body. The person doing the assembling, the building, we usually call that person the creator. And just as God is the creator of the universe, all life, human body, he is creating the body of Christ, the church. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them. This tells us that he has attention to detail. He carefully places each and every member of the body of Christ person by person. He knows who we are. He knows what we can do. He created us. He gifted us. And he knows where we should go. God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. 
this tells us that as God assembles the body of Christ, the church, there is design, there is a plan, it's intentional. It's not random, it's not haphazard. The same authority, attention to detail, and design that marked the creation of the universe, same process as he builds his church. In fact, I think God's ultimate work of creation is not the universe, human life. It is bringing redeemed humanity together into the church. That is his ultimate work of creation. Who put us into the body of Christ? God. Now, why does he put us in the body? We need the body, the body needs us. It's a mutually dependent and beneficial relationship. For the body to grow and function, it needs every member to be present and doing what it's designed to do. And for each member to grow and function, it needs to be part of the body. We need the body, the body needs us. Without you and I, the body is not whole. Without the body, you and I are not whole. Unity with diversity, not unity with uniformity. Our individuality is vitally important because that very individuality is what the body needs. What makes each of us us is exactly what the church needs. The body does not need 10 ears. It just needs two. It needs two eyes, two big toes, two little toes. We do need to grow individually. We need to develop ourselves in all aspects of our lives. We need to develop our relationship with God. But then bring that individual growth and plug it into the body. Where do we find the optimal conditions for growth? If we're part of the body. But we discover true life in Christ when we bring that individual faith and connect it with the rest of the body. As we're part of that community, that body, and we face life and ministry together, what do we learn? We learn that the faith that we practice individually, oh my goodness, it works. We learn, oh, that's how it works. And then we're so encouraged when we meet other brothers and sisters who are practicing the exact same faith. Unity with diversity. Many members with different gifts brought together by God for one body. Well, how does unity, how does unity with diversity work? Paul then examines attitudes and actions. We'll look at attitudes first. First, he points out the do's and don'ts of attitudes. Don't compare. Paul gets right to the shadow side of human behavior. As long as there's more than two of us in a space, it's hard for us not to compare. Look at verse 15 and 16. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, in verses 15 and 16, Paul points out when we compare, two things can happen. The first, envy, discontentment, and then disengagement. I don't want part of this. What we do in verses 15 and 16 when we compare is we push others up, we pull ourselves down. We push others up, we pull ourselves down. There's another consequence when we compare. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. The second consequence when we compare, pride and arrogance bubble up to the surface, and we have contempt for others. Here, we push others down, and we puff ourselves up. The end result of both consequences of comparison is the same. 
disunity and division. Look at verse 25. So that there should be no division in the body. And Paul warns the church, you start comparing, it will go down one of two paths, and those two paths will all end up in one place, division. What should we do instead of comparing? Verse 25, concern and care for each other. Now, Paul outlines five qualities of what it means to be concerned or care for one another. First, it should be equal, verse 25, equal concern for each other. No distinction, no favoritism, no partiality. We treat everyone the same. Okay. Second, indispensable, verse 22. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. When we show concern and care for each other, we value, we treasure, we appreciate each other. The third quality of this care, verse 23, we treat with special honor. We esteem, we lift up, we acknowledge one another. Also in verse 23, treat with special modesty, we protect one another. And then lastly, because we all have equal status and share equal concern, we share life together, the ups and the downs. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We are each other's keeper. What about actions? What can we do to contribute and be participating members of the body? First, be present. Wherever the body is, we're there also. Whatever the body is doing, we join in. It's a lot easier to give money than to give time. It's a lot easier to give money than to give time. If we're gonna step into a serving space, we will each need to look at our schedules, which then means we look at our priorities. In our week, how much time is spent with God? How much time is spent for God? We look at our schedules, and there's no hiding how we spend our time. As you talk with people who are on serving teams, you're gonna find that they all have rearranged their schedules. They have changed their priorities. Because for them, serving is an act of obedience, serving is an act of worship, and they love serving. Because what they have discovered is they get so much more in return. The friendships that are formed on a serving team are remarkable because you problem solve together, you accomplish something together, and then you get to do it again. How can that not build deep friendships? You experience God working, providing, protecting, transforming lives. You see God at work. And then we are changed as we serve. Our priorities, our attitudes, our understanding of God, we start to develop and discover what are our spiritual gifts through service. Unity with diversity. Many members with different gifts brought together by God to form one body. It is actually not a new teaching that Paul introduces. It is the same idea that Jesus taught in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And even before John 15, unity with diversity was the way God wanted Israel to live. And this way of living was captured in the concept of shalom. Shalom refers to wholeness. It does not refer to peace. We have peace because we have shalom. Peace is the result of wholeness. A wholeness in all of our relationships, upward with God, outward with the people around us, and inward with ourselves. When everyone is where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to be doing, the community has shalom. The community is whole. The last point I want to share with you is 
Well, why is God building the church? Why go through all this effort? Why does the church exist? If, if we are going to step into serving, we need to understand the purpose and the reason why we serve. I want to take us to Psalm 34, the first three verses. These are David's words. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Notice in these three verses the number of terms that show up related to worship. Extol, praise, boast, rejoice, glorify, exalt. Six terms in three verses. Exuberant, wholehearted praise. Notice the nature of David's praise. All the time. I will extol the Lord at all times. Constant, unending praise. Second, wholehearted, with all of his being. I will extol my lips, my soul will boast in the Lord. Lastly, notice the progression that occurs in those three verses. David begins with personal praise, but his personal praise is overheard by those in need, the afflicted. The response of those in need when they hear David praise, they rejoice. In their affliction, they rejoice. And then David turns to the afflicted and says, join me in the worship of God. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Inviting the world to join in the worship of God through Jesus Christ is the reason why the church exists. If you and I do not participate in worship, it just falls flat. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say you are awesome in this place mighty god you are awesome in this place abba father you are worthy of our praise to you our lives we you are awesome in this place, mighty God. As I come into your presence, past the gates of grace, into your sanctuary, till we stand. Oh, yeah. 
I want to thank you for tuning in and joining us today. Many of you have written in or called us to share testimonies of how the teaching of living truth is helping you grow closer to Jesus and go deeper in your relationship with him. I'm grateful for you taking the time to share how much it's meant to you. It's a real encouragement to me personally and the entire team here at Living Truth. I'd love to ask you, if you've been blessed by the teaching or found it helpful in your walk with God, would you please consider supporting the ministry financially? There are ongoing production costs associated with bringing it into your homes. And we do this because we hear of many people coming into relationship with Christ and growing in their faith. But we need your help in supporting this ministry. It takes all of us sharing in the ministry for it to be sustainable. And I'd ask you to pray and consider what you could share. Any amount helps and no gift is too small. In fact, we see in the Gospels through the story of the widow's might that Jesus isn't so much focused on the size of a gift, but the heart and faith it's given with. So I'd ask, if living truth has become a part of your discipleship journey, please consider joining our team of faithful supporters. Every amount you donate is stewarded carefully and enables us to continue sharing the love and hope of Jesus around the world. To support Living Truth, you can make a secure donation by visiting livingtruth.ca or by calling 1-888-269-6085. Or you can also send a check to the address on your screen. An annual income tax receipt will be issued for gifts of $10 or more. Friends, I can't express enough my deep gratitude for you. Over the past year, you have helped spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world through your faithful prayers and financial support. As a community, we continue to live out the mission and vision of Living Truth Ministries that comes directly from Scripture. In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, we're given the Great Commission by Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you for the way you continue to express your worship, thanksgiving, and dependence on Christ through your faithful generosity. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We hope that you've gained a deeper desire to see Jesus through the word this week. We'd love to help. Visit livingtruth.ca for resources like our daily devotionals and past sermons. We look forward to growing more with you very soon.